Two households, both alike in dignity. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break forth new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their lives, whose misadventure piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage, the which few with patient ears attend. What here shall miss, our toils shall strive to mend. The prologue very clearly, very simply says, look, here's the story of Romeo and Juliet. We have two foes, two households that are equal, both alike in dignity, and the children of these two foes from the fatal loins, right, the loins, um, they're baby making parts, right? They make these babies and these babies uh, fall in love, but they are star cross lovers. The stars, the fate, the destiny is against them and they're crossed. And anyway, they kill themselves as they take their life. And it's only with their deaths that their parents stop the fighting, which but their children's end. Nothing could remove the fighting except but the end of their children. So for the next two hours, we're going to show you this play on our stage. And if you listen carefully here, what you have missed, we're going to act out for you that, so that hopefully you will understand. All right? That's what the prologue means. Nice and easy. It is a sonnet. We have the dignity mutiny scene unclean. It's A, B, A, B. C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, rhyme scheme, making it a sonnet, 14 lines long. So basically, uh, it's the entire summary of the story. Romeo and Juliet are star-crossed lovers. Their parents hate uh, each other, and they kill themselves. It's very sad. Let's go ahead and move on here to Act 1, Scene 1. So we have the Capulets and the Montagues. They are fighting in the streets. Benvolio is the peaceful one. He tries to stop the fighting. In fact, he says, help me put their swords to the ground. He says, help me stop this fight. And Tybalt laughs and says, stop the fight. I hate you and I would rather kill you. Let's go, dude. And then he starts fighting with Benvolio. So Tybalt is a fiery, angry person. and He wants to continue to fight. Uh, Romeo, however, was nowhere to be found, okay? We don't know where he was. We find out later in the scene that he was just off wandering by the sycamore trees because um, he had a, a bothered mind. And Romeo's problem is that he is in love or he is out of her favor. He loves a woman and she does not love him back and he's heartbroken. It's unrequited love. It, it It's... Love that is gone unanswered. All right, so Benvolio is going to try and solve Romeo's problem. And Benvolio says, look, you just feel sad because you haven't looked at your options. Look at some other girls. He says, that's the medicine you need. Benvolio says, I'm going to show you some other girls. And then you'll know things are all right. Okay, so uh, line 40. Abram says, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? And Samson says, well, I do bite my thumb, sir. So he's saying, are you insulting me? And Samson says, or, uh, yeah, Samson says, well, I mean, kind of. Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> it's like flipping someone off, but then saying, oh, you just walked in front of it. So are you insulting me? Well, kind of. All right. So let's see. Then we got line 84. Three civil brawls bred of an airy word by the old Capulet and Montague have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave with seeming ornaments. Okay. Uh, he continues and he says, If ever you disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. So the prince is talking here and he says, Look, 
three times, thrice, which is another word for three. Okay, Shakespeare repeats himself, just like with the prologue, where he kind of repeats a couple of these ideas, Shakespeare repeats himself. It was an audience who was listening to the play, and he knows this, so he says things a couple of times. So if you missed it, pay attention. He's going to try and help you out. That's what the prince does here. He says, three times you've done this. Thrice you've done this. If you fight my streets again, if you cause more problems, then I'm going to personally hold you responsible, and you're going to die, Mr. Capulet and Mr. Montague. All right. And then we get to the last little bit here, line 21 to 23. <clears throat> Romeo says, teach me how I should forget to think. And Benvolio says, by giving liberty unto thine eyes, examine other beauties. So Romeo says, how in the world could I ever forget this girl that I love? She's so important to me. And Benvolio says, by looking at other girls. All right. So that is Act 1, Scene 1, and the prologue. Let's move right along here. Act 1, Scene 2. It's in the street. All right, Capulet and Paris are talking, and Paris says, line 6, But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? What's your answer? I've asked you about my suit, which, of course, in this case is being a suitor, right? I am interested in marrying your daughter. I've told you I'm interested in marrying your daughter. So what's your answer, sir? I would love to know, can I marry her? All right, so, so Paris and Capulet, they're just kind of friends. And Capulet later even says, you know, to Juliet, you will marry my friend. All right, so uh, what does Capulet tell Paris to do in regard to Juliet? He says, woo her. He says, she has not seen the change of 14 years. Let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think her ripe to be a bride. He says, but woo her, gentle Paris. Get her heart. So date her. Fall in love with her. Have her fall in love with you. All right. Um, all right. At the end of the scene, Capulet says, hey, to, he says to Paris, hey, I'm having a party tonight. You should come. What a great opportunity for you to meet my daughter, Juliet, to kind of, you know, woo her a little bit, get her to fall in love with you a little bit. And then Capulet turns to his servant and says, hey, here's my invitation list. Go invite all these people to the party. And the servant goes, okay, I can't read. Oh, no. And so he goes into the street and he's like, um, there's two guys. They look like they're smart. And the servant goes, huh, excuse me, I don't know who you are, but can you read this? And Romeo is very dramatic. Like, oh, I can read the letters if I know the language. My heart is so full. So it's like, um, never mind then. And then Romeo is never, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I can read. I can read. Give it to me. And he reads the list and he reads Rosaline. Romeo's in love with Rosaline. You can tell by his voice. He's like infatuated with her. So it's a party invitation. All right, this is perfect because the best place for young boys to meet uh, sweet, available young ladies is to go to parties. And that's where they meet. And so Ben Foley was like, dude, this is perfect. We're going to go to this party. You can see Ross Lyon and compare her to all these other girls. Perfect. Okay. Meanwhile, while Romeo and Ben Foley are talking to the servant, Juliet is up in her room with her nurse and her mother. Okay. The nurse's daughter was the same age as Juliet. Unfortunately, uh, she is with God now, is what the story says. So, so the nurse's daughter died, which is sad. Okay, uh, and we are just, we're told twice now that Juliet is not yet fourteen. Okay, so meaning she's thirteen years old. Now, for us, it, it kind of doesn't matter, right? Like, it's just a detail of the story. Um, culturally. That would have been a little bit more normal. In fact, we're told time and again, girls as young as her, sometimes younger, are already married. And girls younger than 13 are already mothers. But that was kind of a cultural issue of the time. All right. Lady Capulet comes to Juliet and says, what do you think about getting married? And Juliet says, it's an honor that I've dreamt not of. I haven't thought about it, Mom. Okay. And then Lady Capulet says... 
Do you think you could love Juliet? Uh, do you think you could love Paris? And uh, Juliet says, I'll look to like if looking like you move, but no more deep will I endart mine eye than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Basically what Juliet is saying is, I will look at him, but I'm not gonna look too hard. I won't promise to fall in love, but I'll check him out. Okay. So Juliet basically says, eh, I'll give it a shot. All right. So line six um, and scene two. What say you to my suit? What's your answer to my request about marrying your daughter? And then 95, 96 to 101, Lady Capulet says, could you like of Paris's love? And Juliet says, I'll look to like if looking like you move. Um, Nope, I got that wrong there. Scene two, line 96 to 101. There we go. Sorry, jumped ahead there. So scene two, line 96 to 101. Benvolio is speaking. And he says, you saw her fair, none else by being by. Herself poised with herself in either eye. But in that crystal scales, let there be weighed your lady loves against some other maid that I will show you shining at this feast, and she shall scant show well that now seems best. And Volio is saying, look, you've only looked at Rosaline, and so Rosaline's all you have in your eyes, but, but, but once you try and look, you will see that what you thought was best it is really not that good, and look at all these other options. Okay. That's what Ben Volio said there. So he said, let's go to the party, and I'm gonna show you some other girls. All right, now scene three, line 12, 10, 11, 12. She's not 14, telling us that she is only 13 years old. She's not yet 13 down here, sorry. Yep, all right, so that's scene two and three. Hopefully that's helping out. And let's go ahead and move on to scene four here. Okay, it's a pretty short scene. Uh, the, the guys are on the way to the party, so they're just kind of having fun. And we got some important ideas here. The first is that Romeo has souls of lead, both souls of his shoes and the soul of his you know, heart and soul, his body, his emotional center. And he says, I'm heavy. My shoes are heavy, so I cannot dance. And my soul is heavy, so I have no fun and I cannot dance. So they're going to the party and the guy's like, come on, Romeo. And he's like, oh, I have a soul. But it's a pun using the word soul in two different ways because it's spelled differently. The soul of your shoe and the soul of your personhood. Okay. But more important even than that is this idea of dreams. And Romeo says, I had a dream tonight. Okay. And, uh, and then Romeo and Mercutio have some pretty funny banter back and forth. Romeo says, I had a dream tonight. And Mercutio says, I had a dream. Romeo says, well, what was your dream? And Mercutio says that dreamers often lie. And so here's another pun, a play on the words, the word lie. Lie is to tell an untruth, but it's also to lie down, right? And so we have both of these words. And Mercutio says that dreamers often lie. And then Romeo spins that around. He says, yes, they lie down in bed where they dream things true. So Mercutio doesn't believe in dreams. But Romeo is pretty convinced that dreams have truth and power. Okay. And then Mercutio goes on with his famous Queen Mab speech, which basically is to say that Queen Mab is a fairy and she changes the way you dream. If she rides over your fingers, you might dream of counting your coins. If you, she drives over your lips, you might dream of kissing a lover. Um, if you're a soldier and she flies across your neck, you, you imagine stabbing your enemies. Um, yeah, but the point is this, Queen Mab is just completely fabricated, completely made up. And in fact, Mercutio kind of loses it here in this scene. And Romeo goes, peace, peace, Mercutio, calm down. 
You speak of nothing. What are you talking about? That's crazy talk. And Mercutio says, exactly. Dreams are nothing. So why are you talking about your dream? Well, and then Romeo tells us his dream. He says, my dream is that some consequences yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile fortune, forfeit of untimely death. Basically, he says this, something is going to happen tonight at this party that puts me on a path towards my early death. Something starts tonight that's going to cause me to die young. Oh, well, he says, you guys are directing my course, so let's continue on. <laughs> so he's like, it's really serious. I'm like, guys, I think something's going to happen tonight, and, and it's going to cause me to die early. Oh, well, let's go party. It's really kind of fun. So, all right, I think that covers that scene. So let us move on now to scene five. We are now in the party. All right. Um, so Romeo is in the party and pretty much right away he sees Juliet and says, oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. He says, she is so beautiful that her face, her glory, her beauty teaches flames how to flame. It's a pretty good line. Now, Romeo's talking to himself, and Tybalt hears the voice, and Tybalt says, hey, give me my sword. I'm going to go kill this guy. And so Tybalt is armed and is on his way to go kill Romeo dead right here at the party. And Capulet stops Tybalt and goes, whoa, stop. Where are you going? And Tybalt's really angry. He's like, don't you know who that is? He's our enemy. He came into our house. And Capulet's like, hey, calm down. I got a good party going on here. We're not going to disturb the party. I've heard good things about Romeo. He's got a fine reputation. He's not causing any trouble. Let him have his party. And Tybalt's furious. And um, so anyway, Tybalt says kind of to himself, uh, he says, I will withdraw. I, will, I won't fight him right now. But this intrusion shall, now seeming sweet, convert to bitterest gall. Tibble says, look, you're going to have your fun right now. You think it's sweet? You think you're having a good time, Romeo? It's going to be like, like vomit in your mouth. That's what gall is. Like when you sometimes go, and like your stomach acid comes up in your mouth. It's like really super gross. That's your gall. And Tibble says, you think you're having dessert now? That dessert's going to turn to vomit in your mouth. That's what I'm going to do to you, man. I'm going to get you. Tybalt's pretty pissed. <clears throat> All right. Now, Romeo then meets Juliet, and he basically says, you're really pretty. You want to kiss me? She goes, okay. They kiss. He goes, oh, that was really nice. Want to do it again? Okay. And they kiss. Like they've known each other for 10 seconds. They kiss twice. It's inappropriate. Don't, don't, don't be like that, okay? Get to know your girlfriend. Spend time with her. Date her for many, many months and years before you kiss her. All right. Um, there's some great language here. Basically, they're using um, a lot of language here of this idea of the holy shrine, that this perfect, sinless idea, okay? And Romeo is saying, you are this perfect cathedral, Juliet. You are the sinless thing, and I am full of sin. I need you to take my sin from me. And so when we pray and we put our hands together, that's what our lips should do. And so when our lips come together, you're going to take my sin from me and make me pure and perfect. So they kiss. And then Romeo said, oh, then, then, um, <clears throat> uh, Juliet says, but now I have your sin. And so now I'm no longer perfect and pure, to which Romeo says, well, give me my sin back. And so he kisses her to try and take that symbolic sin back. Now, it's just fun. It's playful banter. It's flirtation. But the point is this. They have fallen in love at first sight. Okay. Party ends. Romeo's leaving. And Juliet's like, who is that guy? 
And the nurse says, that's Romeo, the son of your only enemy. Ugh. And Juliet says, too early seen, unknown, too late. My only love sprung from my only hate. That I must love a loathed enemy. So Romeo and Juliet now know who each other are. They are the children of the sworn enemies. Rosaline is completely forgotten all about. And we have to see how in the world are these two kids going to find a chance to have a relationship when their parents absolutely hate each other. So that's going to be the trick for the next couple of acts. So let's see your line 44 and 46. Um, it seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a jewel, as a rich jewel in Ethiop's ear, beauty too rich for use for earth too dear. She shows a snowy dove troping with crows. So basically, Romeo is saying how beautiful Juliet. He's saying the contrast of Juliet to everyone else is the contrast of a diamond in the ear of an Ethiopian, a very, very dark black skin. That beautiful, beautiful white, white sparkle of a diamond and against the dark, dark background of the skin. Okay, um, He's saying she is like a perfect white dove surrounded by dark, ugly black crows. So he's making this comparison saying how richly, wonderfully beautiful she is. 115 to 117. Uh, the nurse says, I nursed that girl that you're talking with. I tell you, the boy or man who can get her, marry her, will have the chinks, will have the money. She's from a wealthy family. She's got a big dowry. All right. And 135. Juliet says, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. She says, if Romeo is married, then I would rather die than be married to someone else because he is the most perfect person around. So, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, my goodness, they're heaping it on pretty strong. He's like, got the dream of dying. And she says, I'd rather die if I can't marry him. And Well, we shall see some more of that as we continue. All right, hopefully that has helped you understand the play a little bit. If not, please send me an email or, or contact me and we will try and help you understand better. All right. Have a good day. That's, uh, that's all for now. Bye-bye.